and welcome to another edition of the Hank Unplugged podcast, a podcast that is committed to bringing the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people directly to your earbuds. And and my guest today is is someone who certainly meets that criteria. His name is Father John Strickland. He's a priest at St. Elizabeth Orthodox Church in Paulsbo, Washington. By the way, Paulsbo, Washington is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. He's a, um, he's a scholar. He's a professor of history. He's an author. Um, some of his books I haven't read yet, but the, the, the books that we're talking about in this podcast, I've not only read, but I've read and reread. And they've had such a profound impact on my understanding of church history. In my first interview with Father John Strickland, we, we, we sort of gave a summary of all four books that I want to talk about ultimately in, in, in these next successive podcasts. Um, but that's given me such a great grasp on the big picture. And so today, I, I'm bringing Father John Strickland back to the podcast to talk about the first book in detail. And then we'll, as I said, we'll do another podcast talking about the second book, the third book, the fourth book. We've done an overview so far. You can find it on Hank Unplugged. I think it's must listen. Uh, I've listened to it again myself just because I couldn't grasp everything that Father Strickland was saying while I was doing the interview. And it really helped me to to go back and listen to that podcast. So I'd really recommend that if you want to listen to an engaging podcast that will really stretch your thinking and that will will cause you to understand how important it is to be not only biblically literate, but historically literate, that podcast, which is on Hank Unplugged, just look up Father Strickland, um, that podcast will help you a lot. But today I want to talk with Father John Strickland about The Age of Paradise. That's his first book in the four-book series, The Age of Paradise, Christendom from Pentecost to the First Millennium. By the way, these books available for anyone who stands shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. You can check it out on the web at equip.org or simply write me at Post Office Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. Father John, I am so delighted to have you back uh, on the Hank Plug podcast. And again, I'm indebted to you for helping fill in so many gaps for me in terms of my own historical literacy. Thank you, Hank. It's really good to be back with you. I've been looking forward to uh, continuing our conversation. Yeah, so uh, something that I wanted to start this podcast with is, is, is a quote in your book where, where you say, only by returning to the deep past can we hope to see what we have lost only by remembering what the west once was can we hope to recover what the west again might be which is a civilization with a supporting culture that directs its members towards the heavenly transformation of the world your book, your first book, really goes from Pentecost to the Great Schism or the Great Divide. So I'm going to start in my interview with you today to ask you about Peter's Pentecost sermon. It seems to me that the operative word, not only in this sermon, but in the old Christendom, as opposed to the new Christendom, the operative word is the word repent and not as a singular event, but an ongoing process in the Christian life. That's a wonderful place to start, I think. Um, yeah, I, I, I wrote the book series uh, with the intention of leading um, people in our time, <clears throat> and pardon me, not just uh, Orthodox Christians, but Roman Catholic Protestant Christians, maybe even people who have a secular mindset, back into that deep past that is often um, neglected, ignored. Often people are just simply don't even know that it existed, the first millennium especially. People today see in our culture, in the West, and its, its, uh, its problems, they see causes uh, that spring out of the sexual revolution or 
uh, other things more recent like that. Uh, the They go back in time to the Enlightenment, perhaps, and the secularization of the West. Maybe they go back to the Protestant Reformation and the disintegration of a of a sense of a unified at least western um western europe uh but i think we need to go back to the first millennium that's where we're going to find the answers um to the to the problems we have today in our culture and uh we can go all the way back as you as you indicate to pentecost itself to the first day of church history um i always um bring attention when i <clears throat> when I'm teaching people about Orthodox Christianity, especially catechumens at my parish here, um, in fact, I was just doing this last night at our catechesis meeting, uh, to Acts 2.42, which talks about a um, talks about the, the the life of the church, the life of the church from day one, and how that life never it didn't change, it didn't it didn't um, it didn't uh, deviate from this course. Uh, but from that day forward, we're told by the author of the book of Acts, Acts 2.42, Luke says this, they continued, they didn't stop, they continued steadfastly, without change, without deviation, uh, in the Apostles' Doctrine and in these four things, including Apostles' Doctrine, such as the breaking of the bread, uh, the communion or fellowship, and finally the prayers. Um, and I see that, and I talk a lot in the Age of Paradise in the first chapter about that as a paradigm, you might call it, for understanding uh, traditional Christianity, uh, Christianity from the start, uh, Christianity which infused uh, the, the civilization around it and transformed that civilization and gave it a living culture with values and beliefs that brought to, into existence Christendom, a civilization with a supporting culture uh, that directs its members toward the heavenly transformation of the world rather than the secular uh, transformation of the world, or more recently in an age of nihilism, um, the uh, no transformation whatsoever, but just a surrendering uh, to the forces, often um, insane and, and self-destructive forces of the world. Peter's sermon, uh, which you ask about specifically there, Hank, I think is a great place to start, actually, uh, and its theme of repentance. Uh, because right after he's done giving this profound sermon, uh, after the descent of the Holy Spirit there on the day of Pentecost, uh, the question is raised, what then must we do? And his response is, repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. Um, that message of repentance, of course, is a, is a repeating of Christ's. If that's the first time Peter speaks to the world, you know, beyond the circle of the apostles, if that's the first time Peter gives a message to the cosmos uh, on behalf of the church, it's rather like Christ speaking to the world uh, after he's baptized and, 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 and undergoes the temptation in the wilderness and then comes and announces uh, the beginning of the, of, the, of the new age, the beginning of, 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 of the church. And he does so with the word repent, for the kingdom of heaven is drawn near. Those are the first words Jesus speaks in his public ministry, which we Orthodox just celebrated um, when we celebrated Theophany on January 6, uh, when when Western Christians were celebrating Epiphany, if they did so, uh, we Orthodox in the Eastern tradition celebrate the baptism of Christ in the Jordan River and the beginning of his public ministry to transform the world and to bring it into the kingdom of heaven. And so Peter's sermon is a, a great place to start, I think, as well as uh, Acts 2.42, which I, I love so much. Yeah, and we talked about Acts uh, 2.42. Uh, you just gave a great summary of it again uh, in the first podcast. Uh, the, w w we mentioned the fact that each one of those four elements that you just articulated was preceded by a definite article, the article the. And that is not self-evident in English translations of the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? It's like there's, you know, in, in English, we have a richness in our in our language. I, I know uh, Russian. I don't know a lot of languages. I learned a little Greek. I'm not really good at Greek, but I know enough to be able to parse out and read the original. And I know that that definite art article appears in, each, in front of each of those nouns, the, uh, the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of the bread, the communion, and the prayers. Um, but in English, you know, if we say, um, you know, that person is, um, is I don't know, a hero, 
it means he's he's one of many heroes. He's one of many important people. Um, is a leader. You could say he's a leader. Well, he's one of many leaders. But if you say that person is the leader, and that the is the definite program, uh, uh, definite article compared to say a, uh, which means like an indefinite article. If you say he's the leader or the hero or the something else, that means like he's the one. He's the one. And so there's a real sense here in Acts 2.42 that there's something very definite in traditional Christianity as it's as it's lived out from the day of Pentecost forward. And it's 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 really important to, to get exactly what it is. And that's why throughout the book series, and especially in volume one, Age of Paradise, I think it's so important to to talk about a very definite form of Christianity and its impact on the world. Because various forms of Christianity will come later in in the course of history. And some of those forms of Christianity will not form or shape or influence Christendom uh, toward a heavenly transformation of the world, but in fact, even toward a secular uh, uh, transformation of the world or no transformation at all. And I, I agree. I think that's very important. How important was it to discover the Didache in, in the 19th century to kind of underscore the truth of what you just said? This is the way church functioned. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in its embryonic state. Yeah. I, you know, I, I've never really put myself into that, um, into that research. What, what kind of impact did that discovery have? It's interesting, though, because, you know, as speaking as an Orthodox Christian, we live by so much of what the DDoK teaches. Like, for instance, you know, the DDoK says, we fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Well, we Orthodox are still doing that almost every Wednesday and Friday of the year, with just a couple of exceptions. We fast. We, we keep the fast. Um, baptism and other things, uh, living uh, the way of life rather than the uh, thinking of life as, as, as a way, a path, a passage uh, that can either lead toward the kingdom of heaven or it can lead toward death, you know, the seculum, the untransformed world. Um, these are things that continue to uh, have a big impact on us. How much it in impacted um, non-Orthodox communities, scholarship, uh, church identity, things like that, I, I can't really speak that that well to that, though, unfortunately. Yeah, so let's get back to Pentecost. Here, here Peter preaches the Pentecost message, and 3,000 people stampede their way to Calvary. And then we read in subsequent chapters that the church continues to grow. 2,000 are added to the 3,000, and then the church continues to multiply and grow. And I, I suppose the question I have with respect to that is, why did the church grow so rapidly in its embryonic state, uh, in a state in which becoming a Christian meant taking up your cross, meant persecution, meant vilification? Mm -hmm. uh, how did the church grow so rapidly? And I suppose attendant to that question is, can there be a reiteration of Pentecost in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, short answer to the last question there is yes, I think we, we are ready for that. And we're actually, many of us are living through that right now. Um, but as far as, um, you know, as, as, as far as uh, um, how did the church suddenly come to life and live in, in under such circumstances, as you characterize their persecution and vilification, um, she did so and she attracted converts uh, because she had a superior vision of reality. Uh, this is put forward very powerfully, I think, by what is otherwise a rather secular account of the rise of the church, rise of, rise of Christianity, by a scholar named uh, Rodney Stark. Uh, Rodney Stark has written a lot of stuff on the history of the church. Uh, he's a... Um, He's got a sociological, I think even anthropological background, um, and he did a study. It's a really brief book. It can be read quite easily and acquired and read quite easily um, that, I, that I quote and make use of in my first chapters of uh, Age of Paradise, where he uses as a model some 
religious groups in our time, 20th century, uh, now we're in the 21st, but he was writing in the 20th century, that have had tremendous success in drawing converts. And he uses a model to to exponentially increase the size of the church as more and more converts come through every point of membership. You, you start off with a very small number of people, thousands in the first century, but then this jumps to tens of thousands and quickly beyond hundreds of thousands. And by about the year 300, and of course this is 300 years of history, but you're at about 10 million people who identify with Christianity in the pagan Roman Empire, predominantly pagan Roman Empire. Um, that number is more or less accepted by historians beyond Rodney Stark. Um, I, I think a lot of historians think about 10% of the population of the Roman Empire appears to have become Christian by the time Constantine converted. And we might want to talk a little bit about that conversion of the emperor, Constantine, uh, a little bit later. But as I say in the, in the, uh, in the book, uh, Constantine, um, uh, Constantine um, uh, 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 became a Christian. Um, uh, Christianity did not surge and become popular because Constantine converted. Constantine converted because Christianity was surging and become, becoming popular. We often think that way. It's a rather cynical way to think. Oh, this emperor is only interested in power and administration and, you know, the cynicism of, of government. And he saw, um, he, he decided to become Christian for who knows what reason. And because he became Christian, all the other people who wanted power became Christian with him. And there you go, you have Christendom. But as I say in the book, Christendom existed from Pentecost. It existed 300 years before the state got involved, entered Christendom. Uh, and it did so in an underground countercultural state, uh, such as you just characterized there. Um, you might ask, you know, I, I guess I would answer your question in part also, Hank, by bringing attention to those beliefs and values that were superior. Um, I, for instance, mercy. Uh, mercy is, is something that was considered contemptible in the values of, of pagandom, the values of pagan civilization and culture. Mercy was contemptible. If you read Homer's uh, works, for instance, these great epics of pagan culture and, and narrative, um, which bore the values of, of pagan culture, mercy is a contemptible thing. You take revenge on your enemies. You destroy your enemies. And yet we know Jesus Christ himself uh, preached in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere to love our enemies. He reversed that. He showed us the royal way toward the kingdom of heaven the way of, of, of God himself, how we become God-like in our, <clears throat> in our way of life by imitating and entering into God uh, in his way through Christ, through the life of the church. And that is just simply superior to a, a ethic of uh, retribution and, and vengeance. Mercy. The Christians uh, lived out their mercy by organizing the care for even pagan uh, communities during plagues and 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 uh, and um, and uh, and famines, it was Christians. Uh, even the the pagan emperor uh, um, Julian, the apostate who followed Constantine and tried to return Rome to a pagan culture, recognized that the Christians had completely outdone the pagans by showing mercy toward those in need, and realized that the pagans are going to have to match the Christians on that. On that point, Christians also um, showed their superior values when um, heroically uh, their 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 numbers, their members went into the arena to be torn apart by wild beasts without fear, without terror. <clears throat> In one case, there was a slave girl and her master, her mistress, who went in in Carthage. And they went in holding hands. You know, we can imagine them holding hands, showing love, the equality of their humanity, even though they're divided by class, which is something that that was very strong in pagandom. Um, and that the 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 people who came and saw these innocent people, this these this these young women being destroyed that way, and yet showing love and and hope. Read the epistle of Ignatius to the Romans, written in the early 100s, uh, where he says, Do not intervene for me when I'm brought to Rome to be thrown before wild beasts, 
Uh, but I welcome this as an opportunity to live out the cross that, that Christ gave to those who love him and to enter into real life, not the paltry existence that this world off uh, offers us, but real life, which is communion with Christ eternally in his kingdom. That really had an effect on people who otherwise were left with nothing but this world. And if they had a lot of wealth and power, they could you know, squeeze a lot of pleasure out of this world, but most people didn't. And even those with wealth and power uh, soon came to see, Constantine being the most famous, that Christianity has a lot more to offer than, than any pagan beliefs and values. Those two uh, female uh, martyrs did have a status and wealth. Uh, the ones that you mentioned, but it, it, it begs another question. I don't know if you finished your thought, sorry if I interrupted, but I, I was thinking as you were speaking about how significant it is to underscore the fact that predominant numbers of women became Christians. What was the attraction, I suppose, to, uh, to, to women to become part of the early church? Yeah, one of my... Um one of my the sections of one of my chapters there in the opening is uh, uh by the hearth i think or at the hearth or something like that um it contrasts the arena to the hearth <laughs> contrasts that public space where martyrs are heroically being torn to pieces for public entertainment and some of that public's thinking wait a second there's something really powerful that i'm observing here that's better than what i believe um but the women um, by the hearth, that is to say, quietly, uh, unheroically, you might say, although there is a great heroism in this domestically, um, were converting their pagan husbands to Christianity uh, on a large scale. This is, I think this is more or less accepted by most historians of the early church, that there was a large number of women who were attracted to Christianity. Um, they were attracted to Christianity in part because of uh, because of the of the place the church assigned to women um, equal in the eyes of God uh, to men. There is no longer male or female, Paul says, um, but all are one in Christ Jesus. This was not to overthrow a society in which you know men had authority and women had a more domestic kind of way of life. It wasn't a revolutionary social feminist thing that Paul was advancing. It was just the fact that women bear the image of God as fully as men. That's what Judaism had already said. And women have a place in the life of the church that is equal to men in the sense that they are equally valuable in the life of the church. Um, if you contrast, if you contrast um, early Christianity uh, to the pagandom that surrounded the Christians, uh, women were often, you know, treated with with miserable disrespect. Uh, men were encouraged to hold double standards when it came to their um, sexual lives. They they might be married. That wasn't that was certainly encouraged in Rome. But to keep a concubine or concubines for a man, no big deal. Woman, you know, she was she was expected to just submit and be part of the man's household. The so-called Roman pater familias had. Um, uh, almost slave, uh, slave ownership kind of power over not only his wife, but his children. Um, male uh, male uh, slave owners could um, sexually uh, exploit their female slaves with impunity. Um, uh, maybe most astonishing to us in modern Christendom, even a secularized one, uh, though not a nihilistic one, we're, we're reaching this point where re we're returning to this this miserable uh, condition even now. Um, but most astonishing, really, is the fact that infanticide was widely practiced uh, in ancient Rome, in pagandom, before Christendom arose. And in pagandom, the greatest philosophers all supported the practice. Aristotle, uh, most uh, notoriously, Plato suggests it, um, other people, Seneca, I quote them and I refer to their um, their support of infanticide. Um, we have documents from the early um, centuries when Christendom was expanding in its influence. Documents from pagan, um, uh, one document from a pagan, I, I quote this document, a pagan husband to his pagan wife at home. He's like on a business trip, 
<clears throat> he's traveling away from her and she's pregnant and expecting the birth of their child. And he writes to her, we have the, the, the letter it was preserved somehow. And he writes to her saying, you know, honey, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm being kept longer than expected, you know, on my business. So I won't be home when the child is born. If it's a boy, I keep it. If it's a girl, destroy it. <laughs> Love and kisses hubby is basically how it then <laughs> continues. It's just unbelievable. It's just like, what? But this is how the world worked under pagandom. Uh, in pagandom, Christianity uh, brought forward a superior and heavenly, um, heavenly vision of the value of both uh, boys and girls. And girls, um, it's known throughout the pagan world, were like this uh, husband suggested, often considered uh, of no value to a family when they were born. And infanticide was widely practiced the way, uh, 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 so sadly, so so uh, horribly, uh, abortion is a practice in our time. And there are even talk today about um, some form of infanticide being uh, reintroduced and allowed in, in the, in the post-Christian Christendom we live in today. Uh, so these things made women very aware of, um, of their value, of their worth, in ways that pagandom could never do. And, and so a, a large number of women were drawn to the church, as, as you just said there, and became important members. And already in the New Testament, we can see this with Phoebe and Priscilla, whose husband is Aquilus, and, and, and other female, uh, you know, Thecla, for instance, who doesn't show up in the scriptures, but she was widely recognized as this heroic woman who converted under St. Paul's ministry. And John Chrysostom talks about her. I think Jerome talks about her in the West. Thecla was this first century woman that converted people, and she she was just this dynamo of of, of Christian faith um, at at in that in that time. Yeah. So um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the persecution. <clears throat> uh, the blood of the martyrs becomes a seat of the church, as it were. The last great pagan statesman of Rome was was Diocletian, b before uh, the advent of Constantine, and and he initiated what is often referred to in history as the Great Persecution. Uh, significance of that on the eve of Constantine coming into the picture. Yeah, right. The Great Persecution of Diocletian was a really big event. It must have been, it must have been, it must, it's, it's almost uh, unimaginable what what it would have been like for an historian like Eusebius, who writes a history that bridges both the period of Diocletian and Constantine, to go from this overwhelming, like just apparently overwhelming um, effort to destroy Christianity on the part of the Roman state, to uh, a, a, the conversion by the emperor himself to Christianity. Um, it must have been amazing in the action of persecution. Um, Diocletian, you know, came to power in a very brutal way, that was how people came to power. I mean, the Roman state was ruled by by emperors and, and dictators that killed their predecessors in order to uh, gain power. Um, that's not to say in Christendom that didn't happen. It happened quite a few times. In Byzantium especially, in the East, the Orthodox East, uh, there were Byzantine emperors who killed and maimed and did all sorts of hideous, horrible, sinful things to get power. Uh, so this was Christians were not immune to this. But in the pagan state of Rome, that's how Diocletian and many before him had come to power. And um, and once in power, um, he launches this persecution. It was particularly heavy in the East, uh, in places like in Nicomedia and other places. Um, thousands of Christians were put to death burned in their churches, put to death. Uh, we have saints' lives from this period of time. Uh, great martyr George, if you're named George, uh, you're probably at some point in the in your lineage and your ancestors, they consciously named one of your ancestors, uh, um, George, after this great martyr. Catherine of Alexandria, I talk about her in, 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 uh, in the Age of Paradise. And it was just uh, relentless uh, against the church, and it failed. Now, you, you quoted Tertullian, who lived in the third century. He didn't live through the Great Schism, I'm sorry, the Great Persecution, but he did uh, kind of articulate the fact that um, this persecution of Christians actually had the effect of 
of making Christianity more compelling to the pagan population of Rome, more compelling, more, more, um, more convincing. And and earlier you asked a question: Are we in today living through a time when another Pentecost-like moment could happen? It's interesting, Hank, to to imagine to go back in time and imagine us living through maybe the latter stages of that great persecution of Diocletian and and to think like it can't get any worse you know Christ must be coming any time now and then suddenly in ways that could never be predicted because God's ways are never predictable really um things turn around and 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 and, and growth occurs marvelous things start to happen so perhaps uh Hank we're living in a time right now where things in this uh, age of nihilism uh that I call it that we're living through will get so bad that people will come flooding into the church recognizing her superior values to the uh d- d- the d- the just the degradation you know that that the human being is subject to in our increasingly in our culture today uh, I can certainly say that as an orthodox pastor um not only at my church here in Paulsbo Washington but many many orthodox churches are experiencing a uh, surges of inquirers and 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 catechumens and converts um and and there's no doubt that part of that is 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 occurring because the seculum is not what man was made for a secular world is not is not what human beings were made for and and the promises of the enlightenment or uh, a, a, you know of science and uh of all those other things postmodernism are really showing themselves to be um vacuous and and counterfeit and people are coming back to christianity now in a way maybe they 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 did then after the great persecution had died down so Diocletian, much. if i could just add just yep. close that little chapter diocletian's remarkable because uh after having launched this this brutal uh, been the head of and really the leader of this great brutal persecution. He was actually supported and even exceeded by other um, high-ranking members of the uh, autocracy. But but after that, he finally uh, he he retired. He abdicated. This unthinkable, unknown. Usually, people are killed um, and succeeded by the their their murderer. He abdicated and retired to grow cabbages <laughs> in modern day uh, is Serbia is where he wound up in the Balkans. And finally, his last act was to kill himself. He finally committed suicide, Diocletian did, uh, ending his life. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, 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 and that ending brings a new beginning to the Roman Empire with Constantine. Uh, Constantine himself becomes converted. And we talked about women and their influence in the early church. Huge, huge influence on Constantine was his mother, Helen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's no way to understand what happened with Constantine without thinking about St. Helen. Yeah, equal of the apostles, we call her yeah. uh, in the Eastern tradition. Yeah, because of her impact. So yeah. Constantine is a seminal figure now. We're in the fourth century, and Constantine comes to power, and Constantine has this incredible impact on Christianity. Um, you, 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 they've experienced the great persecution. And now Christianity, mm. through Constantine, becomes the religion of the empire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's unthinkable. It's just absolutely unpredictable. Um, there's an interesting book, um, to get a sense of how unpredictable this was, there's an interesting book um, published uh, in the 1980s called like the something of Christendom. It's like over my shoulder here. I can't remember what the actual title was. It's on my shelf. And uh, it doesn't have much to say. It's kind of interesting. But it it in the 1970s or 80s, it was kind of like speculating. So what would happen if like suddenly the, the uh, Soviet Union, its uh, communist government decided to convert to Christianity? You know, like that's basically what it was like for the government, the the heirs to, to Diocletian and Augustus and Tiberius and all these people to convert to Christianity. And that's like not a whole lot of far off from what happened. I mean, the Soviet communist atheist system establishment collapsed. And today, 
um, whatever you th one thinks about Putin or any other actual leaders of, of Russia, R Christianity has certainly taken its place back in Russia again and has an influence on in public life. Um, whether one you know appreciates that or or uh, agrees with the way it's being done, I'm, I'm I'm certainly not talking here about the war. I'm just talking about you know, schooling and and uh, and government and laws that that um that that are against you know public blasphemies and things like that. It was just unthinkable that that would have happened you know just 20, 30, 40 years ago. But that's what the Romans lived through when Di when uh, when Diocletian was followed by Constantine. Uh, in the book, uh, Hank, what I I think I really try to bring a lot of attention to is um, two models of statecraft. I mean, first of all, what I want to say here is throughout this book and all my books, I really want to emphasize what's called cosmology, traditional Christian cosmology. Cosmology is an understanding of what the world is. Uh, what the world is. We we Christians know that God created the world. Genesis accounts for this. God evaluated the world after he created it, and he said it's very good. Uh, but then the world became overrun by demonic forces with the fall, and um, and and so that becomes very complex. the The New Testament speaks about the world in both positive and negative ways. Uh, John's Gospel, especially, uses the word cosmos everywhere. You know, and the cosmos is often a, a a bad place. The world hates Jesus. It will also hate his disciples. But then we're also told, famously John 3.16, that God loves the world, that he gives his only begotten son to it. So the world um, is, um, is a really important um, category of understanding our civilization because our civilization takes place in a world, the, the cosmos created by God. What Constantine does in his conversion is um, he fills in something of the of the cosmic effects of, of Christianity, of a heavenly imminence that I talk about in, in chapter one, about how traditional Christianity does not consign the cosmos, the world, um, to total oblivion and meaninglessness, but rather because God becomes incarnate. That's at the center of traditional Christianity, that God becomes man, that Jesus Christ joins divinity with humanity in an unconfused way in his own person, and that people baptized into him, his body, sacramentally, participate as human beings in his divinity, therefore. Therefore, in this world, the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. The only thing that's needed, as, as you opened our conversation today, is repentance, is repentance. Well, Constantine fills this cosmic transformation uh, in a bit by now establishing a Christian state, which continues because a state is always exercising power, continues and will always continue to uh, violate and, and, um, and, and disregard the gospel of Jesus Christ by 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 issuing harsh punishments, by executing um, people and 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 fighting wars and 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 all the bad stuff that happens in government. But Constantine also uh, tried to act out on uh, some of those gospel teachings. Um, for instance, he he uh, he um, he uh, he took away the right of a slave owner to kill or murder his slaves something the slave owner enjoyed under the Aristotelian kind of values of, of the pagan Roman state. Now the Christianized Roman state, never fully Christianized, but bearing some of, of traditional Christianity in it, did not allow that to happen. Um, uh, other uh, uh, measures are taken to support women, especially under Constantine's successors, like um, uh, um, under Justinian and his wife Theodora, Efforts were made to support women in society in ways they had not been before. Um, Constantine did other things as well. He abolished crucifixion, that horrendous way of putting people to death in such a cruel, tortuous way. Um, Constantine moved the capital from, from old Rome to what became known as New Rome or Constantinople in the Byzantine East. 
uh, the town he founded it on was called Byzantium. That's why the, the state that was now Christian became known as Byzantium. Um, in this new town, he he did not allow for, he had actually abolished all of those gladiatorial contests. Blood sport was abolished under Constantine. There was a um, a horse racing arena in Constantinople, but there was no Colosseum in which people would gather for the matinee performance of seeing two men fight to the death for, for their public entertainment. That was abolished by Constantine. <clears throat> and so there were efforts to, um, to, uh, to clean up, morally to clean up the, 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 the Roman state as a result of Constantine's conversion. But most importantly is that the state ceded to the church and her leadership, uh, the state now being part of the church, um, ceded to the bishops uh, a, a position of leadership in society um, and, and gave them freedom and gave them uh, the, 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 the means to, to act effectively. Um, and so the first ecumenical council of 325 in Nicaea um, is a result of that, is an example of that. Some people like to mythologize Constantine as being the um, a manipulator that he used the council to kind of create his own imperial Christianity. But as a matter of fact, Constantine told the bishops, come together, make your decisions, and I'm going to abide by those decisions. And so the bishops came together and they declared, in the most famous case, that the heresy of Arianism was exactly that, a heresy, and Constantine presided over that. Um, and uh, and so there were a lot of good things that came about. Uh, churches are now publicly built and protected. You can't burn them down. You can't murder the Christians inside of them, like happened under Diocletian. Um, Christians could could evangelize. They could spread their faith uh, without fear. Uh, so many good things happened as a result of Constantine's conversion. Uh, that's not to say Constantine himself ruled, you know, in a sort of sort of angelic way. He continued to exercise power, and some of his deeds, which I document in the book, even against family members, were brutal, and which no Christian would ever countenance. Um, but but he, as a ruler, did um, did uh, did act this way, and subsequent Christian rulers did as well. But that doesn't disqualify Christian statecraft, um, in, uh, 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 um, in you know, entirely. Um, that would be my argument in the book: is that statecraft is part of the cosmos. And uh, and Christendom spread even into statecraft. Yeah, so Constantine was going through a transition, just like the Roman Empire was going through a transition. But his enduring mark on civilization, the Edict of Milan, the uh, the calling, as you said, yeah. the con convening of the Council of Nicaea in three twenty five A.D. Um, and and yet, despite his enormous impact in a positive way on Christianity within the Roman Empire and beyond. Constantinianism is still used as a derogatory word in many Christian circles in the modern epoch. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, I think, um, you know, I think as far as I know, and of course, I, you know, I wrote a history that's, you know, 2000 years in, in length. And so, um, different points along that history, I had more research experience than others, and I wouldn't want to claim to be a specialist or an authority on you know every stage and every aspect of that history. I'm, I'm definitely not that. Um, but um, I was impressed by a, a work by a Protestant author of our time named Peter Lighthart, and I quote him at length in these sections on Constantine in my book. Peter Lighthart is a Protestant scholar. Um, very active today in, in certain um, platforms. Uh, he uh, started an uh, institute um, uh, uh, that promotes the establishment of a Christian civilization, and he um, writes for uh, First Things, uh, predominantly Roman Catholic uh, online journal and things like that. But he wrote a book that I quote called A Defending Constantine. And it's a, it's a study of Constantine's conversion and its place within um, within in, within the cosmos, within the the political cosmos of the Roman Empire, and what Peter Lightheart, coming from a Reformed tradition, where you would never expect there to be a whole lot of you know respect for um, for uh, a full throated support of Constantine, uh, he's actually criticizing um, that that 
that movement you just uh, referred to, alluded to, called Constantinianism, by which is usually meant uh, a Christianity that's co uh, co-opted by the state and corrupted because of the political um, uh, 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 kind of uh, um, exigencies that the state is concerned with. Um, that that real Christianity, uh, the imagined Christianity of the first three centuries, was a persecuted Christianity, which would have nothing to do with the state and keep itself from power in all at all costs and never get tainted by that. There is a um, there is an element in 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 modern in contemporary Christian circles that that holds this position. And Peter Lightheart wrote his book, Defending Constantine, against that position. And what he did, interestingly, was he brought attention. I mean, I, I quote different aspects of his presentation. One that I found most interesting was, um, uh, contrary to what, what might be assumed, that when the state got involved with Christianity, um, the church was corrupted. And then when the state um, kind of discharged Christianity, got rid of it with secularization in modern times, um, things would get better. In fact, the state got a whole lot worse. And Peter Lightheart does bring attention to the fact that before Constantine, there were there were animal sacrifices being made all over the place to the Roman god, to the uh, Roman emperors as gods and things like this. There were human sacrifices being made in an informal sense in all those blood sport that were keeping the Roman pagan state functioning with the bread and circuses of the Colosseum and all that. Once Constantine converted, that came to an end, and it was the bloodless sacrifice of the Eucharist. It was the bloodless sacrifice of the divine liturgy, the mass, whatever you want to call it, um, that the Christians were offering to God that was transforming the world according to the kingdom of heaven. That replaced the actual blood sacrifices of of animals and and indirectly of men take away christianity from the state as you do in modern times and as peter whitehart says you return to blood sacrifices which is what communism and nazism both brought on an unprecedented scale in their own secular um, utopias of the 20th century their nihilistic utopias of the of the 20th century um, so I think that that that's an interesting way of thinking about statecraft is is the place of sacrifice and blood with within it. Uh, with Constantine and his successors, um, that all got um, that all got channeled or directed. The the religious transcendent um, tendencies of any state got directed toward um, toward the liturgical life of the church, and because of that. Um, human sacrifices and violence were no longer tolerated. <clears throat> help, help us to understand two words in context of what you're saying, symphony and Caesaropapism. So, um, so yeah, the result of Constantine is that now the, the state self-consciously uh, um, uh, applies Christian principles to its state craft, its, its politics, its government. And two terms that are relatively helpful in understanding how that happens are symphony and Caesaropapism. Symphony is the ideal of how it's supposed to happen beginning in the early centuries. Symphony um, is a model of statecraft, Christian statecraft, by which the ruler, the emperor, and we're dealing, of course, at a time when there's just one head of the state, works in harmony or cooperation or symphony with the leaders of the church, namely the bishops, namely the bishops, or in the case of the Bishop of Constantinople, the Patriarch of Constantinople in the East. Its alternative in an, an idealized kind of extreme form is what's called Caesaropapism. Now, Caesaropapism is a model of government where a Christian government where the ruler, uh, the emperor, let's say, the Caesar, right? The Caesar rules like a pope, <laughs> papism. <clears throat> that is to say, 
this term Caesaropapism is a, an, it's an anachronism. It, there was no Pope, there was no papalism, there was no papal supremacy during these early centuries after Constantine. It's a much later model um, that's imposed on the past uh, by historians. But the idea is, is that what becomes the supreme um, uh, pontiff, the Pope of Rome, uh, becomes the model for how the, the emperor acts. Um, and, and so in this case, instead of working in harmony or symphony with the patriarch, the emperor would try to subordinate the patriarch and other bishops to his, the emperor's own uh, priorities when it comes to church life. So Caesaropapism is, is symphony gone bad. Symphony as a model of Christian statecraft gone, gone wrong. And it, it does show up in the history of Byzantium and in the history of the West as well, uh, when certain emperors uh, tyrannize the church, thinking that they're doing good things for the church or for, um, for church life. The most uh, notorious example is iconoclasm, when an emperor named Leo III in the early 700s, um, uh, or 600s, um, uh, uh, no, 700s, I'm sorry, I'm mistaken about that, 700s, uh, introduces a policy to destroy all the icons, all the the um, the liturgical images that exist in his empire, namely the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. And uh, the result is a century of destruction of, 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 of liturgical art. And finally, um, uh, it's, it's rejected, that whole movement is rejected as a heresy by the seventh ecumenical council in the eighth century. Um, well, that's example of a Caesaropapism. There are other examples um, uh, where the, the emperor or the empress of Constantinople um, uh, tyrannized church leaders like John Chrysostom was tyrannized by the empress in the early uh, 400s, for instance, finally driven out of Constantinople by her. Um, yeah. People like that, e e Eudoxia. So those are two just broad models that can be used by historians like myself just to characterize and get a sense of what's going on. Such models always kind of obscure, you know, the richness and the detail of reality, but they do help the the mind kind of get its get its get a sense of what's going on. Both uh, were operative in the history of of Christian statecraft after Constantine's conversion in the early 300s, and both uh, not only remained in the East in Byzantium, but also appeared in the West among the Franks, who became rivals to Byzantium uh, when they created their own Western Roman Empire. And then subsequently, uh, during the Reformation, Middle Ages and Reformation Age, um, both were, were forces. It's very interesting to consider what happened in the Middle Ages, is kind of beyond the scope of our discussion today uh, around these questions. We can get to that when we talk about the next book. Yeah, um, in, in this context, though, I uh, I want you to expand a little bit on the dualism of someone like Tertullian. Uh, I think his famous statement was something like, "What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem?" Mm -hmm. um, also, the the pessimism of someone like Augustine contrasted with. Uh, the more optimistic view of Eusebius. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Uh, that's something I, I do spend some time talking about. Once Constantine converts, church leaders, um, and uh, there are two that I focus on who lived at about this time, Eusebius in the, in, the, uh, in the East, he's the author of that church history I mentioned, and then a little bit later, Augustine, St. Augustine of Hippo in the West, one Greek, one Latin, one East, one Eastern, one Western. Um, they had, you know, I think, you know, measurably different uh, responses to the rise of Christian statecraft. Um, Tertullian is a good point of reference when talking about the latter, that is when talking about Augustine. Augustine coming from North Africa and writing in a Latin tradition, uh, who Augustine really didn't uh, understand and didn't read Greek well, um, was really in the lineage of Tertullian, who lived in the 200s, so quite a bit earlier. But Tertullian was a moralist who had a very um, extreme um, um, uh, suspicion 
of anything outside of the church, anything outside of the experience of church life that 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 existed at, at his time, at a time of persecution. Um, he saw the world with a great deal of suspicion. His cosmology was one of suspicion. It was a pessimistic cosmology. As you as you quoted him, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Is his way of saying, what does pagan culture, art, philosophy, uh, the richness of the uh, pagan world, pagandom, uh, have have to do with our our life as Christians? Our our home is Jerusalem, the the where where Pentecost occurred and where where the Jews had been centered, and so he was very you know very sharp against you know christians who go to the the arena to the public entertainments and and things like this he was very inspirational writer um not canonized because he got involved in in a, a schismatic movement uh, partly due to his extremism um but he uh, augustine inherited this pessimistic suspicion of the world of the cosmos he wasn't always that way um, Peter Brown, his biographer, his most accomplished biographer, who not only wrote about Augustine uh, biographically, but about the history of Western Christendom um, as a as a in general as a civilization, uh, he he uh, he noted that um, that that uh, Augustine had initially been very positive about Con uh, Constantine's conversion and Christian statecraft. He Augustine saw this as just the world being filled ever more full, fully of Christian of Christ, of a Christian presence, and if the Christians are present, so is Christ and the Holy Spirit. So is the kingdom of heaven. But Augustine uh, lived long enough to see the collapse of the of the Christian Roman Empire in the West when the barbarian, um, largely um, heretical uh, Arian barbarian invasions took place. And um, the fall of Rome um, took place. Alaric um, conquered Rome, um, and then and then Augustine's hippo uh, on the north uh, uh, coast of Africa was itself surrounded when 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 Augustine died. And so, his last great work, which was the City of God, creates a very, as you use the word, dualistic contrast between the true Church. Uh, and and then like the 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 kind of the the kingdom of men, the city of man versus the city of God. Augustine created this dualism. There's a city of man which is always interested in power um, and wealth and lust, and then there's the city of God. And the city of God and the city of man coexist on earth. Um, um, in, in, in you know they coexist, but they're really very distinct elements. And he really tried to, to 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 create the sense that the Christian has no 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 place really in this in this city of man in the city of the world. What does after all Athens have to do with Jerusalem? That's a very stark contrast, which leads to a pessimism about um, about life in this world. Um, that Augustine and Augustinianism more than Augustine, but Augustinianism really becomes a important force in leading the West in a more pessimistic direction that after the Great Schism of the 11th century will cut the West off from the East in dramatic ways. It's at the center of my, my book narrative. In the East, back to Eusebius, there's a much more optimistic evaluation of the effects of Constantine's conversion. Uh, Eusebius praised Constantine. Uh, Eusebius praised the effects of, of, of Constantine's conversion, the, the first ecumenical council that he lived through, the Edict of Milan that you mentioned, which legalized Christianity, um, the building of churches, the elimination of um, persecution, all of this stuff he saw as being very encouraging, like the world is being filled with the presence of the church, and while the world will never be and can never be the kingdom of heaven, can't be, nevertheless, the kingdom of heaven has come into this world through the incarnate God and the church that worships him liturgically and sacramentally. And so for Eusebius, there's an optimism, whereas in Augustine, there's a pessimism about the world generally and about the Christian state within it particularly.
Something you mentioned earlier, I want to go back to iconoclasm. Um, <clears throat> Christianity's first reformation is called the iconoclastic reformation. And that became an impetus for dividing the East and the West. And I think it's important to talk about that for, for a multitude of reasons, really, but uh, iconoclasm is still with us today. There are so many Christians today that have a very strong, visceral response to icons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In addition to that, maybe we can mention, at least in passing, the distinction between icons as they became westernized and the eastern kind of icon, where you have icons as an unnatural way, so to speak, of understanding supernatural things, uh, unnatural renditions that, that point to something that is, that, that is supernatural. Uh, it's a way of understanding hidden realities. Uh, and, and then in the West, how icons took on this, this naturalistic aspect. So not only did icons uh, serve as, a, as an impetus or a dividing line between East and West, but the, the, the context of icons themselves started becoming very, very different. Yeah, yeah, that is an interesting... Um... Well, that's an interesting thread in the uh, in the in the division between East and West, which actually has some real manifest, like distinct historical manifestations. Um, so, yeah, we would all say that you know iconography became a part of church life at an early stage. Um, I mean, we again, you mentioned you know the discovery in the 19th century of the didache, and like you know a Protestant who would have saw. Fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays is some sort of Pharisaical uh, kind of thing. Was confronted by the fact that the first Christians were doing that in the first century. Well, um, we discovered in the 20th century a place called Dura Europos in the in uh, in the uh, uh, in basically modern Iraq, where a um, where a church is a church had been built, a synagogue as well. Actually, it appears with iconography within it. And uh, and that kind of blew people's minds. Like, wow! Because this is from the third century, if I'm not mistaken. This this uh, iconography. And um, you know, there's the the more famous catacombs of Rome that show you know a woman in the Oran's position praying and things like this. And and those were sometimes dismissed as just kind of wall murals. But but here we actually have dedicated buildings for the Eucharistic assembly, it appears, and not discovered, not known until the 20th century. Um, and this kind of blew a lot of people's minds who like to think, you know, all iconography is some sort of invention of the post-Constantinian kind of phase, and it's a secularization and a profanation of Christianity. But uh, as a matter of fact, um, icons were a really important part of church tradition. And when the emperor of Constantinople, Leo III, tried to abolish them, it created a huge uh, scandal. And it was in the West where the Pope of Rome um, uh, 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 called it uh, the heresy that it was. And he was supported by uh, figures in the West that were out of the reach of the of the Byzantine state and could could act much more freely to to call out the uh, the, uh, the 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 sacrilege and heresy that iconoclasm was um, in the East, there were other um, church figures. John of Damascus, being the most important and famous, Theodore the Studite, being another, canonized saints who wrote treatises defending iconography and showing why we Christians have a place for iconography in our worship and our life, and they did so perfectly effectively, so much so that the Seventh Ecumenical Council alluded to their work and um, and uh, and canonized icons in the life of the church. But the difference between how icons were uh, thought of and rendered in the East and the West was something, like you were saying, um, no, noticeably different at that time and became much more different as time passed. An interesting... Um, chapter in this history, Hank, is is when Charlemagne's court, right when iconoc iconoclasm is like in its strongest, 
Constantine's court, I'm um, not Constantine, Charlemagne's court, Charlemagne being the Frankish ruler who's crowned emperor of the Roman West uh, in 800, um, Charlemagne's court was filled with theologians, Frankish theologians, that is to say, Western European Germanic theologians. And they self-consciously, more or less at, at Charlemagne's direction, excoriated the Greek theologians in Byzantium. They attacked what they called Greek heresy and Greek schism and, and Greek culture and all this stuff. And, and one of the chapters in my book is, 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 um, is, is, uh, has a section called something like the invention of the West. It's at about this time under Charlemagne that a self-conscious West is created against the East. Before this time, you've got Christendom. It is, you know, what we would call the West today. But now you start to get this sense that there's a West that's opposed to the East. This is before the Great Schism, the 11th century Great Schism, 1054. And But it's a really important background to it. And Charlemagne's court began talking about icons in particular in this context, uh, ex, uh, criticizing how icons were understood in the East, uh, both in the heretical sense but also in the canonical sense, uh, their ad ad attitude toward icons was very different than, than, say, John of Damascus that I mentioned a moment ago, or the Seventh Ecumenical Councils. And so you get this development where East and West become divided around the question of um, uh, what makes a proper icon? Is it really to instruct and has a pedagog pedagogical purpose? Uh, Pope Gregory of Rome had said as much, or uh, does it do more than that? And in the East, it does more than that. It proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> an icon is an icon and not just a religious picture or painting insofar as it proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ, which gospel says that God became human, that the incarnation is real and not a nice thought or idea or a fantasy, but that divinity was in fact truly joined to humanity, and the result was the God-man, Jesus Christ, who being perfectly God, but also perfectly human, must be depicted in a way that proclaims that gospel, that he had two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, <laughs> that he was just like us in his humanity. And if he was not just like us in his humanity, the fathers of that council said, then Christianity is subverted. Christianity is subverted by iconoclasm, by a claim that you cannot make icons of Jesus or his saints. It's, it's subverted because it subverts the doctrine of the incarnation, which is at the center of our salvation as human beings. <clears throat> One of the things that has always fascinated me, particularly with my own grandkids, is the attraction that young kids have to icons uh, w w without necessarily being taught that these are sacred, that there's something mm. mystical going on. They seem to sense that. Mm. And I have seen yeah. that firsthand uh, with more than one of my grandkids. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and it certainly, you know, at, at church, uh, I, you know, as a pastor, I see this little children, toddlers will always kind of, you know, break free of their parents during the service and kind of run up to an icon and just kind of look at it. And there is an attraction there. It's, it's quite, it is mystical and it is quite striking, I think. Yeah. I want to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, significance of the, the ecumenical councils in the in the first thousand years of church history, in the age of paradise, as you call it, mm -hmm. uh, th those councils had enormous significance, and yet not all of those councils are are validated in the Christian world today. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the Seventh Ecumenical Council that we've been talking about um, against iconoclasm is a good example of that. We could look at others, like maybe the first with its rejection of Arianism. Um, there are forms of Christianity. Well, it's not even Christianity, of course. I wouldn't say so, but I'm thinking about the Jehovah's Witnesses, namely, I, and 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 that's kind of a, a modern version of Arianism, uh, that Jesus is a great man, but he's not God. 
<clears throat> but the Seventh Ecumenical Council, the last that the Orthodox recognize universally as being, you know, an ecumenical council rather than a regional or local council, um, you know, dealt with the question of icon uh, uh, iconoclasm and is seen by the Orthodox Church, for instance, but also by Roman Catholics as being um, authoritative. And what's interesting, uh, Hank, there is that, um, you know, one of the one of the uh, key terms I use throughout the book in talking about a civilization that's really influenced by Christianity is traditional Christianity, a, a Christianity of tradition, a Christianity that that was suggested in Acts 2.42, where they continued steadfastly in a distinct tradition with definite articles between before each noun, that there's something distinct about Christianity. And one of the distinctives is doctrinal integrity, doctrinal integrity. And, um, and what the councils always were trying to do was to honor and live out um, and define doctrinal integrity. And in the case of, say, iconoclasm, the, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, um, you know, was very aware, as John of Damascus had been, that the, the, the second commandment, given in Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, uh, said, make no graven icons or images of things in heaven, things on earth, or things below the earth. And so just by itself, you see, what the council does is it doesn't just, you know, take a Bible quote and then say, well, that's it. It, it interprets the Bible quote within the Holy Spirit. The councils liked to issue their statements by saying, it's like the, the, like the apostles did in Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. That's actually how the Seventh Ecumenical Council issues its statement authorizing um, icons. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, not um, we've searched the scriptures and we found the, the, the quote that matters and, and tells us what we need to do. The scriptures were written within that tradition. The scriptures weren't even written for a generation after Pentecost. And then the scriptures were assembled into what we now call, not then, but now, call the New Testament, 27 books, not 26, 28, according to the tradition of the church, according to the uh, the the understanding of what made a true and not spurious gospel, for instance, the Gospel of Thomas thrown out because it didn't have any place in the canonical New Testament. How did the Church know that tradition? Um, well, when we get to the eighth century with the Seventh Ecumenical Council, that's what's that's the living faith, the living tradition of the Church enabled the fathers of that council to recognize that iconogra iconography was legitimate and appropriate. The second commandment is followed by um, is is followed five chapters later in Exodus twenty five now by a commandment to make basically graven images terms not used of angels standing over the ark of the covenant woven into the uh, the the um, the curtains of the of the tabernacle. Um, so already that second commandment as important and surely it was important as important as it was it wasn't an absolute commandment. Because God, five chapters later in Exodus 25, commands graven images of angels to be made, things in heaven, in other words. But what the council, uh, uh, the Seventh Ecumenical Council and its fathers said was, that's all very significant. However, what really is important here is not the old covenant, but the new covenant, that Christ is the fulfillment of everything, and Christ is the in the incarnation um, makes everything new. And so now we understand that while icons, such as we're talking about here, may not have been appropriate in the past, now because God has become human and Jesus had two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, in order to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, we authorize, if it's done appropriately, icons to be painted and venerated but not worshipped, because only God is worshipped. Icons are just shown honor if they appropriately and liturgically depict the God-man Jesus Christ or saints that have died in communion with him and have therefore been filled with the Holy Spirit by him. You so that's an... Yeah, yeah go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. No, no, no I, I want you to finish your thought. Well, I was just going to just throw on... So that's like how the councils you asked about during this first millennium functioned. They 
they drew from scripture and studied scripture in in, in uh, but they did so within the tradition of the church according to that traditional christianity that acts 242 speaks of and they did so so that they could arrive at conclusions like this one and not just open the bible and find a verse and say we're done the significance of the tradition, um, when you look at words like homoousius or homoousius, that in the first ecumenical council you have the the notion that Christ is of the same nature as the Father as opposed to a similar nature. I mean, this is one Greek letter between those two words, homoousius and homoousius, and yet that makes all the difference in the world. So there's a, there's a one doctrinal, iota. <laughs> yeah, one iota, Literally. Uh, the, the small Greek letter. There's an incredible significance to the precision of the councils and why those councils can't be tempered with. In fact, in, in the Third Ecumenical Council, Fourth Ecumenical Council, there's in Canon 7 of the Third Ecumenical Council, where you say, very strong anathema attached to anyone tampering uh, with the precision of the councils, because this tradition is not to be tampered with any more than the Bible itself is to be tampered with. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're. I think that that is so important to keep doctrinal integrity intact in in Christendom. Christendom is a civilization with a supporting culture that directs its members toward the heavenly transformation of the world insofar as the doctrinal integrity is kept intact, among other things. The doctrinal integrity is kept intact. <clears throat> and when that that one iota becomes kind of optional, uh, that, that really undermines Christendom. It not only undermines the faith, of course, uh, my history is not really a history of the church and, and church doctrines. It's a history of culture, but it, it's centered upon the influence of the church and her doctrines uh, over what we call Western culture, Western civilization. And as long as that doctrinal integrity is honored, uh, things were healthy. And when it was not honored, things um, got uh, 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 troubling. Uh, you know, just kind of a a side issue that I think is related to what you just said, Hank. Um, you mentioned the canon against um, against tampering with the creed or tampering with um, uh, the faith this way um, more than once. But I know the Fourth Ecumenical Council issued a statement saying, if anyone tampers with the symbol of the faith, the Nicene Creed, um, uh, he's to be anathema because <laughs> you change the creed, you change the faith. You change the faith. And that, of course, um, it becomes very significant when you add a word like filioque, um, which is just what four syllables, I guess. I just had to run it through my brain. Four syllables. Filioque. Yes, four yeah. syllables. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, I have to say, Frank, when it arose, when it was introduced in the Frankish West and, so, and promoted by Charlemagne, it was roundly and decisively rejected by the Pope of Rome, the very Pope, Leo III. Uh, who, uh, not to be con confused with the Emperor Leo III of Byzantium I mentioned earlier, who launched iconoclasm, but the Pope, Leo III, reigned in the year 800, who crowned Charlemagne, was had enough integrity himself to reject Charlemagne's efforts to impose on the Nicene Creed, the Filioque, when Charlemagne's own kind of court bishops were advancing the filioque and pressuring the papacy to accept it, the papacy at that time, an orthodox papacy, said, no, we're not going to do that. So much so that this is a fascinating little detail in, in, in church history, but also cultural history. Pope Leo III had a shield, a silver shield, um, on which the Nicene Creed was written uh, without the filioque and placed right over the relics of St. Peter at St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. Um, the filioque, he was saying, would never be part of, of, the, of the Roman faith, of the Roman Christian faith. Well, of course, it eventually did become part of it. And when it did, just a generation before the Great Schism, it really alienated the East from the West. It really alienated those who kept the Nicene Creed according to it, as it had been written and honored that canon. Um, against altering the faith, altering the the doctrines, altering the creed, uh, uh, really alienated the Orthodox in the East um, uh, uh, away from 
the West where this change was taking place, this doctrinal integrity was being weakened by the addition and changing of the creed with the filioque. Yeah, so, so I want to elaborate on that a little bit because I think this is the seminal point <clears throat> where you start having uh, a chasm between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. It, it revolves around those four syllables. It revolves around that word filioque. What are we talking about when we're talking about and the Son? What's the significance of that? Okay, yeah, well, I take that up in the book. I also uh, return to it in Age of Division, the second volume, because that, that volume's written, starts with the Great Schism, and so that this, this theme is relevant there. But <clears throat> the, the word filioque is a Latin word, which when inserted into the clause about the Holy Spirit in the Nicene Creed, um, alters the Nicene Creed, um, uh, and it's inserted at the end of the sentence, uh, the, the Nicene Creed was expanded by the Second Ecumenical Council at Constantinople at the end of the 4th century, and it included a statement about the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, period, who with the Father and the Son is, is worshipped and glorified, but who proceeds from the Father, period. This is an allusion, uh, it's more or less a quote, uh, from John's Gospel, when Jesus says, I will send you the Spirit who proceeds from the Father, period. Well, Frankish Western bishops were evangelizing Aryan territories in Spain, and they found it um, effective to um, defeat Arianism with its claim that Jesus is not God by, by making the Spirit proceed not only from the Father, but from Jesus also. Because if the Spirit proceeds from Jesus, Jesus, therefore, must be, like the Father, God. So this was seen as an effective evangelization tool in their efforts to bring the Arians into orthodoxy. This is about the 6th century and, be, and, and, and beyond. By the time of Charlemagne, about 800, it has become the way of, of rendering the Nicene Creed in the West. And as I just said, it was a scandal to the popes who said you cannot change the creed, even for good reasons like trying to convert heretics to orthodoxy. But the, the Franks stood their ground. They saw this as part of their culture, cultural war against the, against the East, um, and, um, and they stood their ground. And finally, because they as, uh, had so much political and military influence, and uh, they were so needed by the popes, by the 11th century, early 11th century, um, the Pope begins using the filioque in the creed in Rome. And those shields that Pope Leo III had put up against the filioque, they just disappear. <laughs> we don't know what happened to them. They had been there once to defend Rome against the filioque, and then they just disappear in the, by the 11th century. But the filioque was considered quite in, important, uh, uh, Hank, um, and I, I talk about this in the book in ways that's really hard to do just verbally, you know, at short, in a short space or concise way. Um, the filioque um, um, seems to subordinate the Holy Spirit, seems to subordinate the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church to uh, the presence of Jesus. And when you get a, a pope uh, who begins to claim that he is not only the superior, supreme bishop in the church, but is in fact um, uh, 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 the vicar of Jesus Christ, which becomes the title of the popes after the Great Schism, vicar of Christ. That is to say, he stands in for the absent Christ. The pope becomes Christ's presence in the church in the absence of Christ. Then, with this filioque clause in place, the spiritual and mystical experience of, of sacramental life, liturgical life, is subverted. And that effect, um, and it has, to, it has to, there's books that have been written about this that are very hard to summarize in just a few words, but that effect reduces what I call the, the paradisiacal culture of the West, uh, the, the experience of the presence of the Holy Spirit and Christ immediate, Christ's immediate presence in the sacraments of the church, and it creates a different kind of culture in the West uh, in the form of Roman Catholicism.
I also want to talk a little bit about the what's called the Nicolaitan uh, schism uh, by uh, by some scholars and other scholars call it the Photium schism. Uh, Actually, I don't know of a so single single scholar who calls it the Nicolaitan schism except myself. <laughs> but I have to give credit to a um, then a deacon. Uh, now a deacon, then he wasn't, uh, 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 Jamie Magruder, who, uh, w when I was at seminary, first used that term, and I thought, well, that's a perfect way to use this term, but go go ahead. Yeah, yeah, well, that, that that's a great point that you make, but I mean, uh, it, it, the, the bias against the East is actually encapsulated in the phrase Photian schism. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's the thing, Hank, is we live in a in a West that has systematically and historically, traditionally, you might say, um, uh, consigned the East, uh, including orthodoxy, um, to oblivion, to this foreign, strange, problematic, schismatic, heretical, whatever kind of for largely forgotten um, culture and civilization. When in fact, um, if you look at the history uh, of the church, the person who initiated that schism was not Photios, it was Pope Nicholas. Pope Nicholas is the one who excommunicated Photios, um, and his uh, Nicholas's successor, John, he uh, restored um, communion with the Patriarch of Constantinople, and in doing so, uh, presided over a uh, a or or supported a council, which rejected the filioque. <laughs> um, again, the papacy stepping in her heroically to reject the filioque. Um, but the pope who, who caused that schism to happen was uh, Nicholas, Pope Nicholas, not Patriarch Photios. But since history in our English-speaking scholarship has always been written in light of the Roman Catholic and, and then later Protestant bias against or ignorance of the East, uh, we are used to calling that, and historians will usually just unconsciously and kind of, frankly, uh, forgive me, stupidly in my opinion, um, use the term Photian schism as if Photios was the cause of it. That's an incredible story. I mean, I, the, the story itself is, is, is worth the price uh, of the book, uh, the whole story about Photius and, 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 and Pope Nicholas, and it, it, it's 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 an incredibly important part of the book in that it 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 starts to show you that there was a prelude to the Great Schism. Uh, the Great Schism takes place formally, as it were, in the 11th century, but this is a prelude in the 9th century uh, to uh, to the separating uh, the separation of East and West. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a kind of a, it's a prelude. It's a Dress rehearsal, <laughs> to put it in dramatic terms, yeah. Yeah, talk about liturgical space. I mean, this is uh, also part <clears throat> of the difference between East and West, the arrangement of liturgical space so that the temple is experienced as heaven on earth. I mean, this is a macro issue in a sense because in the East, the idea is Christ comes into the world in incarnation and he chants, enchants the world and in the West, you have more of an idea of escapism, that you leave this world, this world is inherently sinful, you leave this world. But in the incarnation, the idea in the East is that Christ comes in, and now we have heaven on earth. So there's a completely different paradigm in East and West. Yeah, it is. I mean, it reminds us of the iconographical question. If icons proclaim the incarnation as real, um, and we have a physical image of, of the face of Jesus that communicates to us the presence of Jesus. That image is not Jesus. It's an image of Jesus, but it communicates to us the real presence, the, the immediate presence of Jesus in our, in, in, and his kingdom in our midst. Um, so also architectural space communicates to us the presence of the ki kingdom of heaven um, in, in the space that we occupy here while still living on earth. And this becomes really one of the, what becomes the key distinction in my narrative between East and West is the loss of this paradisiacal culture, which really and immediately communicates the presence of the kingdom of heaven in this world. Again, this world never becomes the kingdom of heaven. This world cannot become 
the kingdom of heaven. This world is infested by and overrun by demonic forces, and it will always be a broken place, benighted by by uh, by by um, by evil. However, Christ has come into this world, planted his church in this world, and the church will be here until the end of the world. And as long as the church is here in her life, especially her sacramental life of communion with Jesus Christ, she, the church, creates a space, um, a presence of Christ and his Holy Spirit within this world, as benighted as the world is. And so we find that as architecture gets elaborated, um, it really takes on a important role in communicating and proclaiming the incarnation, <clears throat> communicating the presence of Christ in this in this age. There are so many different um, ways of uh, uh, points of uh, uh, to to bring attention to Hank. I would never be able to do justice to it in our conversation right now. But I do have a chapter that that talks a lot about heaven on earth uh, in the liturgical and and um, and sacramental uh, life of of the of, of Christendom, um, a good ex a good single example of it is the principle of orientation. <clears throat> we have in English that word orientation. Most of us kind of get a sense of what that means. It means like it it's a process by which you get a sense of where you belong and where you're going and what to do. Freshman orientation at colleges gives freshmen, new new students, a sense of where they have to go to do certain things. Well, if you think of the word itself, it comes from the word orient, obviously, and orient mean, means east. If you go to the orient, you go to India, China, Japan, something like that. It means east in Latin, orients in Latin. And the word is actually designed, uh, invented, to give um, e expression to the fact that Christians worship toward the East. And if you go to historical churches, in most cases, there are some exceptions, you'll find that the altar is located in the easternmost part of the of the church building, and you enter from the West. And, and this orientation, this facing East, is grounded in the biblical revelation that man's communion with God is somehow symbolically related to the East. For instance, paradise, which is what the heart is supposed to desire in communion with Christ, is planted in the East, according to Genesis. <clears throat> when Malachi gives his prophecy of the coming Messiah, he calls him the S-U-N, the Son of Righteousness, as it were, rising in the East. When uh, Christ himself says the Son of Man will come again, uh, in glory, he will do so like lightning from the east. And so early fathers of the church brought attention to this principle of eastern orientation, this eastern word worshiping. Basil the Great was the earliest of them, um, but this became a big part of how Christians position themselves facing the east. Like Muslims, they face if they're in, in well, I'm come from kind of the Seattle area. If a Muslim is worshiping around me, he or she's going to be facing east toward Mecca. But if he's in in uh, in in uh, some other part of the world, uh, let's say Pakistan, for instance, or Indonesia, he'll be facing west toward Mecca. We Christians look at no place on earth because our hope is the kingdom of heaven, which has no place no abiding place in this world. Here we have no abiding city, but we seek the one to come. And so whether we're in Seattle or Tokyo, Orthodox Christians, many other Christians as well, face the East beyond this world. And so that's a reminder then, that spatial disposition in worship is a reminder of how space becomes a symbol of, our organization of space becomes a symbol of the coming of the kingdom of heaven into this world. Now, you mentioned some distinctions between East and West in terms of architecture. It's it's just starting to appear by the end of the narrative of Volume 1, Age of Paradise. But by then, you have Hagia Sophia built in Constantinople by Emperor Justinian, which features a huge central dome, such as if you go out into a field at night and you look up at the starry sky, it seems like a dome. Heaven is a dome over your head. And so this becomes a symbol of the of heaven, but it's heaven coming down to earth. Inside that dome at its center is painted an icon of Christ looking down on his people. He's the head, 
They're the body assembled underneath him, right? As they face east toward the altar, where, whence comes both the gospel that's read to them and transforms their lives and the Holy Eucharist in its chalice that comes to them from the altar from the east and fills them with life itself, with, with divinity. So they stand underneath this dome, which symbolizes the kingdom of heaven having drawn near into their midst. That's a beautiful statement or architectural proclamation that the kingdom of heaven is drawn near, that the incarnation is real. <clears throat> In the West, you have a, 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 an interesting tendency toward a basilica-like church, where you have a long, elongated buildings that that emphasize this this east this eastward uh, orientation. And uh, there's a beautiful church built in uh, Ravenna by Justinian, also about the same time as Hagia Sophia. That um, it's um, uh, 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 Saint Apollinaire Nuovo is what it's called in Ravenna, Italy. And though in Italy it's very much of a Byzantine church, but it's basilica in shape, long rectangular form, no central dome, but it shows saints along the walls, all of them facing, men on one side, women on the other, facing the altar to give orientation to all the worshipers who have come there. So they're all facing the altar, that is to say, facing paradise themselves. With time, and we see this in the um, in the uh, in the uh, Rome uh, the Romanesque architecture that comes and precedes Gothic architecture in the West. Just before the Great Schism happens, we start to see the West of a church buildings being decorated and elaborated in the West. That is to say, in in the Frankish architecture. Um, of this time. And I bring attention to this in my book. It's interesting to start to see what's called the West work of a church. This is what's really most famous and most noteworthy in a in what becomes the Gothic cathedral, is the Western entrance to a church with its entrance portal in the center, and then on either side, a tower that's built, castle-like at first, and then it starts to get pointed toward uh, its top, and this, this structure, this west work, again, not on the eastern part of the church, but on the western part, uh, it points upward toward heaven. And as I think you just alluded when you were introducing this topic, um, what we can say then is this is almost, in some ways, it's still orientation toward heaven, but it's almost like working in an opposite way now. That is to say, if the central dome of Hagia Sophia symbolizes heaven on earth and so many um, Eastern churches are built with that central dome. You know, think about Russian churches with their cupolas, their, their domes and all that. The dome becomes a symbol of heaven on earth. So these westward spires become symbols of, 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 of heaven not on earth, but escaping or, or departing from earth. Again, it's a, it's a kind of an orientation toward heaven, but it suggests that heaven is found not on this earth. And that's a really interesting thing when put in the context of other cultural uh, and theological developments in the West, which follow that Augustinian pessimism that we spoke of earlier, where the kingdom of man, this world, uh, really has no real, no, no meaningful contact with the kingdom of God, which is absolutely not of this world. When you have that pe that cosmological pessimism um, becoming more and more prominent in the West. <clears throat> where icons are not accepted in the way they are in the and 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 conceived as the way they are in the in the East, in the case of John of Damascus and the Seventh Ecumenical Council, they're just teaching tools, but they do not proclaim that Christ is present in the incarnation. When you have architecture taking this direction, and then with time after the Great Schism, other developments will take place that will further undermine that paradisiacal culture, that culture of the West, which once had a very strong sense of the kingdom of heaven in this world, transforming it, but less and less so as time goes by. Yeah, this is something that's uh, so important to underscore, because we're talking about the age of paradise, the first thousand years of Christianity, the age of paradise, the old Christendom, and then what we're going to talk about in subsequent podcasts is the new Christendom. And one of the big dis 
distinctions is that in the old Christendom, there's no sense of leaving this world. I mean, if you look at the biblical text uh, in, in Revelation, you see the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully mm. adorned for a husband, and a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people. He will be their God. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. Why? Because God himself is going to wipe every tear from our eyes. God himself is going to be with us. So the direction in the old Christendom was God coming to live with men. In the new Christendom, it was this universe, which now groans and travail, we're, 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 we're leaving that. We're going to we're going to heaven, but in the old Christendom, it wasn't that God scraps things; it was that God redeems things. That this universe itself is going to be redeemed, not destroyed. It's going to be redeemed. So also our bodies. So there's a great difference in emphasis in the old Christendom and the new Christendom. Yeah. Yeah, that God, um, God will fill uh, His creation with Himself and sanctify it and be present. And I quote um, the Revelation at the end, I think, of chapter one, uh, a, a very similar passage from from John's Revelation. And I think you know this is a, of course, this is a revelation of what's to come beyond this world, but it's also a revelation of what's already happening in this world through the presence of the the sacramental life of the Church. And so, as you know, the Orthodox Divine Liturgy, and I would I would assume you know Western liturgies as well, make self conscious references to the imagery of Revelation, the the seven branched candle stand, for instance, on the altar table, uh, falling down in front of the throne of God, things like this. Chapter four of Revelation is in some ways an image of what happens every Sunday at an Orthodox Divine Liturgy is this is already a reality we're participating in. It's not consummated yet. We should never think that this world is is the end. It's not. Uh, it travails. <laughs> it's filled with darkness. But Christ has come into this world, and he really has... He has really taken his place by the Holy Spirit, beginning with Pentecost, um, in this world, uh, in the body, in his body, the church. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I want to uh, uh, talk about a couple of more, uh, a couple of other things as we start to bring this podcast to a conclusion. Um, the distinction between being and becoming. I want to emphasize that one more time. We we are created in the image of God, but we're <clears throat> becoming more and more Christ-like, and and that happens to the sacramental and liturgical life of the church. Yeah, deification, I guess, is kind of yeah. you know the the uh, model of salvation that's so very influential in in the fathers of 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 the East and some some Western fathers too, but especially in the East. And I think that that's a really important part of understanding um, the culture the, of of a healthy Christendom uh, the, of the old Christendom, the first millennium Christendom, even in the West. And 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 I also want to. Uh, to mention this whole idea of mission. Um, in, in, in the Eastern Church, uh, mission is in many ways uh, defined by uh, Cyril and Methodius. Uh, they first go to, uh, to the Western Church, but the Western Church wants them to evangelize in the Latin language. Latin becomes predominant. Um, in 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 the in the Eastern Church, no, it it's it's you can you can evangelize in the language of the people, and so you have a whole paradigm of mission that is established by Cyril and Methodius um, a, a, as a result of them uh, them them ending up in the Eastern form of missions. Uh, so it, it gives a paradigm of missions that, 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 that becomes instructive for us today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really striking uh, um, uh, difference uh, in, in the eighth century, the mission of Cyril and Methodius, you know, they're invited 
to come to Moravia, basically a Czech land, um, to come and evangelize the people there <clears throat> by the ruler. And uh, they do so in the in the Slavic language uh, language of that people by by translating um, the liturgy and the scriptures from Greek into that language, creating an alphabet for them to use things like this. And when uh, Frankish bishops discover this, they, having sh been shaped by Charlemagne's Latin kind of obsessed um, way of, of of doing liturgy and and evangelization. Uh, Charlemagne, you know, he 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 oversaw the the creation of large schools of Latin that really universalized the use of Latin in the West. Um, they were criticized and even persecuted by those Latin bishops. Again, we're at a time before the Great Schism, so they're all Orthodox, you might say, um, or from a Western point of view, they're all Catholic. <laughs> they're not Roman Catholic because they're not all working under Rome. Although Methodius and, and Cyril did go to Rome and did interact with the popes there. Um, and that whole idea that you have to, everything has to be done in one language, Latin, or maybe three languages, Latin, Greek, or, or Hebrew, according to the titulus, the three uh, languages used by Pontius Pilate, as if that's like some sort of a key to understanding Christian missions is what Pontius Pilate wrote on the top of the a cross that he crucified Jesus on. Um, that is just a weird, um, uh, inexplicable development to an Orthodox or Eastern Christian. Cyril and Methodius represent what we stand for, and that is, um, when possible, you know, use the, the culture of the people, the language of the people you're evangelizing, lift them up, celebrate their culture insofar as it can be baptized and transformed. When it can't be baptized or transformed, yeah, it has to be rejected. You know, you can't have human sacrifices or something. Um, a good example of this, too, in our in more modern times, of course, is the Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox uh, missionaries to uh, Alaska, yeah, innocent, most famously innocent of Alaska, early 19th century um, uh, missionary to Alaska. He can he converted the Aleuts and 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 Tlingits and and so forth in Alaska to Christianity by translating everything into their native language and giving them an uh, a, a, a grammar to work with and things like that. He found things in their culture that were beautiful and that could be sanctified and integrated into uh, into the true faith with its doctrinal integrity. I'd like to bring this this podcast to a close. Um, I, I do think there has to be a real emphasis on the fact that there's an old Christendom and a new Christendom, and you can divide all of history in a sense at that juncture. So you have a thousand years of the old Christendom and you have a thousand years that that bring all kinds of innovations in the church. The old Christendom characterized by perpetuation, the new Christendom is is characterized by innovation. Uh, the papal innovations that, that come into the church uh, after the great divide, after the great schism of the 11th century, 1054, you start to have all kinds of innovation, and that innovation continues on in the Protestant Counter-Reformation. And, and I think in some sense you can dichotomize between the old and the new by those two words, perpetuation and innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I also use the word reformational Christianity in contrast to traditional Christianity to characterize Western Christianity after the Great Schism. It was reformational in character, but another way of saying that is innovative because it brought a lot of innovations um, that weren't there in the first millennium. And maybe we'll, I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about that when we discuss volume two, The Age of Division. But um my, you know, that that larger kind of vision of two, you know, two Christendoms, you know, I think that that, for me anyway, was quite helpful in, in thinking about this deep past that we began our discussion with, that I do think we today, living in the West, really need to recover and, and explore. The West of the first millennium was still the West we live in, uh, but it was a very different West. Uh, and I want I want to think about the West not as something bad that has to be rejected in favor of going to the East or something, but a West that was once Eastern. That's the title of one of my sections in in Volume One. 
when the West was still Eastern, when we in the West still had roots in Eastern Christendom, in the old Christendom, not the Christendom that, that started to form with the Great Division, Great Schism, and beyond, a West which went through um, very several kind of uh, 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 developments, first division, uh, then uh, utopia, and finally now nihilism, but a West that was really infused with the spirit of the East as the West was in the first millennium. I think that's the answer to our culture now, and I think you know, speaking as an Orthodox Christian, we'll get a lot. We'll get there uh, in so far as we're able to kind of think about and explore and embrace uh, some of what the Orthodox uh, tradition has to offer. It's a fact that after the Great Division, the East remains the old the old Christendom. The old Christendom doesn't end in uh, in the 11th century in the East. It continues, although eventually. Um, it will be westernized by Peter the Great of Russia, communism, things like that. But um, there's still an Eastern Christendom that we, I think, can really animate um, our discussions and reflections on what needs to be done today uh, to make the West, again, a great civilization. And when we talk about East and West, we're not just talking about geographical distinctions. Not really. Not really, I think. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I like to say... I'm as Western as you can get in uh, on the uh, on the northwest coast of the United States of America here in the Seattle area. You can't get much more Western than I am on the on the map, and yet I'm you know thoroughly Eastern or Orthodox in my spiritual uh, 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 mindset. In our try, next. To, <laughs> try to be, yeah. yeah my, it, my books. I really want to emphasize this. My books are not an attack on the West. Some I think some people have read them as like, oh, this is some sort of you know diatribe or some sort of you know attack on the West, and the West is good, and why is he attacking the West? I'm a, I'm not attacking anything, but I am trying to tell the history of something that went wrong, <laughs> but it had a, a a millennium of being more or less right, and when it went wrong, it was just that it lost its contact with the East, it lost its contact with with orthodoxy, but it's certain certainly a very pro western narrative if you think of it that way maybe a little bit of a promo on what's coming up on our next podcast as we talk about the age of division christendom from the great schism to the protestant reformation as i as i mentioned you're going to do a lot of writing about the 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 papal reformation all of the innovations that come through the roman church and then that leads into the Counter-Reformation, which happens within the protest, uh, the, the protest against the Papal uh, Reformation. But it's really not a Protestant Reformation as much as it's a Counter-Reformation in some sense. Yeah, or a continued Reformation. That's, that's the argument I'm making in that book, is the Age of Division for the West was an age of Reformation. It began with the papacy, and was brought to a very um, uh, decisive conclusion uh, by Protestantism. But they were both two sides of one coin uh, when seen from the perspective of the first millennium. And so there's a lot in common with each, and that's what I try to bring out in the book. Very important to understand all of this, because if we understand this, then we're going to know how to respond to the issues of the day. Uh, the issues of the day are oftentimes a reaction to a a false form of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. Absolutely, Hank. I think uh, not only a false form of Christianity, a false god, a god that we don't ourselves believe in as Orthodox um, or traditional Christians, because I want to use that that phrase, you know, so Roman Catholic and Protestants who, you know, sympathize with and 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 see value in that first millennium don't feel like, you know, that they they have no place in it. But but I think that really what what's going on is it's a loss of transcendence, a loss of enchantment, a loss of uh, a real experience of the kingdom of heaven in this world, transforming this world in a heavenly way that loss leads to where we are today. It really does. And the reaction that we have against Christianity today uh, is a reaction against a Christianity that did not exist in that first millennium. Maybe we can end the podcast with one 
uh, emphasis, and that is, I've talked about, and I said this in our last podcast, how important it is to be biblically literate. Uh, we live in an age of biblical illiteracy. But I also pointed out how important it is for us to be historically literate. And that's really why I'm promoting these four books so heavily, why I'm so passionate about people understanding the broad strokes, at least, of history. So again, your your emphasis here on why it's important for us as Christians in the 21st century to become historically literate. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's important. And and would you um would you like to hear from me kind of like why I think that is and just a Yes, nutshell? exactly. That's yeah. that's how I'd like to end this podcast. Why it's so transcendently important for us not only be not only to be biblically literate but to be historically literate. Yeah. I think, you know, if you look at the Bible, certainly if you look at the Old Testament, you see plenty of evidence of the importance of uh, of 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 historical consciousness of being part of a community that started before your own generation certainly part of a community that that goes beyond your own individuality uh the psalms you know and and uh and 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 uh Deuteronomy and other passages from the old testament speak about how valuable and important it is for the people to continue what they've received from their fathers and in turn to hand that on to their children and their children's children for generations yet to come. I think that we in the West, especially we Christians in the West, whether we're Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant, um, I think we all have a vested interest in restoring our sense of a, of a deep history that goes all the way back to the beginning, to Pentecost, and to see uh, where in that history we can find inspiration to address the real problems that we have today. Um, wh when, when I get to the age of nihilism, I open it with an account of Friedrich Nietzsche, who's kind of a famous atheist, so defines postmodernism and the 20th uh, century's nihilism. Um, and it was Nietzsche's kind of reaction against Christianity. He just railed against Christianity. But when you read what he was writing, it was like a Christianity I don't even recognize. And I think that what we want to do is we don't want to just think that the Christianity is, is today what it always was, and therefore its relationship to our culture is what it always was. Uh, there was a millennium when Christianity had a vibrant, vitalizing, and transformative uh, effect on the civilization and culture of the West. And the fact that it lost that effect and that it's been replaced in our time by the most self-destructive and nihilistic tendencies is, is not a suggestion that Christianity is to blame. It's that the history that followed our, our, our loss of contact with that original uh, uh, Christian culture, uh, the history has led us to this. Uh, and we need to uh, separate ourselves from the values that formed in that history and beliefs uh, so that we can reorient ourselves, come back to that term, reorient ourselves toward a healthy and paradisiacal uh, Christian culture. Well, thank you, Father John Strickland. The Age of Paradise, your first book, Christendom from Pentecost to the First Millennium, uh, the subject of this podcast. The next podcast we're going to do is The Age of Division, Christendom from the Great Schism, 1054, the Great Divide, also known as the Great Divide, the Age of Division, Christendom from the Great Schism to the Protestant Reformation, and uh, that'll be the second uh, in the series, and then we're, we're, we're going to go on to the third and the fourth. Uh, we'll have, when we're done with these podcasts, an understanding of history from Pentecost to the present, and again, I'm indebted to you for your writing uh, for your historical knowledge, but your ability to communicate it uh, with, 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 I think, passion and precision. I, uh, again, very much love your work and deeply appreciate you, your ministry, and the impact you're making in the 21st century. Thank you, Hank. And, and it's a real honor to be on your show, and I really do appreciate what you're doing as well. So I look forward to our, our next conversation. That'd be great.
Look forward to it as well. Again, interesting, informative, inspirational. The books that we're talking about, you can find them on the web at equip.org. They're available to those who stand shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. You can find them on the web at equip.org. You can also write me at Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. And if you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe, please rate, please review. It helps a lot. Thanks for tuning in to this edition of Hank Unplugged. Look forward to seeing you next time with more of the podcast. So long for now.